Hey guys, Jason from Critical Dice, and today I have the great fortune to be interviewing Wolfgang Bauer from Cobalt Press. Wolfgang, how are you this morning? I am doing great, thank you. Right on. You got your coffee ready this morning? Doing good? My coffee's ready. I got that strong Seattle espresso going. Yeah, I've got my coffee going on too right there. You're ready to go. Well, Wolfgang, you've been uh, in the D&D space and tabletop gaming and RPGs for a very long time. But how did this uh, kind of lifelong career slash love of the game start? When did you first play D&D or, or, or get into tabletop games? Uh, it was the very late 70s with the blue box for me. Nice. Um, I had been reading Lord of the Rings. I walked down to a local hobby store. They had this big box with a red dragon on the front. And I'm like, that's for me. And, um, and I didn't know what I was getting into. And of course, I recruited my sister and the neighbor kid and i uh i ran them through the adventure in the back of the book and and it went from there right so it was yeah it was a very simple start and uh oh going way back that far back like they shipped the monster manual for the advanced dungeons and dragons system before they shipped the player's handbook or the dmg (laughs) so all of a sudden i had a lot of monsters but i didn't have a system that explained their stat blocks i'm like well i guess in a few months we'll find out what that (laughs) is yeah i can't imagine a single problem with doing it in that order that sounds fine (laughs) (laughs) that's the way they shipped it (laughs) <laughs> and I'm just happy they had any releases, right? Like Village of Homelick came out and some of the other adventures, but they came out once or twice a year, it seemed like. So, um, yeah, people complain about the pace of releases now, and I, I quietly grumble to myself. <laughs> yeah, no, it used, I remember I, I started playing in the late 80s, and I remember there was like a new little, like, you know, 20-page booklet, like every three weeks or something, you know? It was just... There was so many things out there. Absolutely. They had it down by then. Um, but in the late 70s, they were still figuring out how popular it was and how to make it happen. And they were printing, you know, little black and white booklets. So it worked for me. Yeah. I think it worked for a lot of people. So you've been playing since you were a kid. and But at a certain point, you made the transition from uh, not just consuming the material, but to making material for games like D and D what, when did that transition happen and, and what was that like? Um, I think my first paid gig was actually not for D and D. It was for, uh, iron crowns, middle earth role playing. Oh, nice. Um, that was the first like standalone piece. They wanted me to compile a lot of magic items into one big book and compilation seems like it's easy, but then you get into it, and it's like, i got to make a table of all these items. I've got to alphabetize 2,000 items. I've got to format everything. Well, it turned out to be a lot of work when I thought, oh, it'll just be quick, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> and people learn that lesson about compilations all the time. <laughs> um, um, so that was like that first piece but I also was writing for the magazines at that point I was writing for Dungeon Magazine Um, at 15 I want to say I sent off a query um, by US Mail uh, with a stamp (laughs) I hate dating myself like this but it's true Um, and you know a letter uh, signed by my parents saying yes you know our son is not of age but we give him permission to you know submit this and if you want the rights we'll sign a contract that sort of thing um and they liked it they liked my first pitch and it was short and i wrote it up and i sent it in and then i you know ran to the mailbox every day for 30 days saying okay it's going to be in the next issue and you know it was like eight months later that it finally hit print wow you know they got it they put it in a pile they're like well where are we going to slot this in well we've got one issue in production we got the next issue all plan out maybe the issue after that if it fits um Mm -hmm. you know so it was like it wasn't instantaneous but my understanding of the time was they said yes it's gonna happen right yeah because they're waiting for an issue where they need like six inches uh to fill a space and they're like uh where's the pile you know right uh, right but you know when it did happen it had an illustration it had my name on it Uh, a few weeks later a little check came along i'm like "Ah, i am officially published (laughs) I wanted to do it again. (laughs) That's awesome. So you just kept kind of submitting stuff? Throughout high school, I submitted stuff. Throughout college, I submitted some. um, And I think it was 
five or six pieces. One of them I co-authored with a buddy of mine, Steve Kurtz. Um, I rose for Talakara about a death night. That was fun. Um, and then at some point I started writing, uh, you know, bigger pieces for myself, um, things that didn't get published. Um, and, and after, yeah, in graduate school, uh, my buddy Steve, who was my co-author, said, hey, they're hiring. You should submit something. I'm like, eh, what are the odds, right? They're going to have like a million people. I don't want to move back to the Midwest. I don't know. I, I, he literally talked me into applying for the job. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you're right. I feel dumb if I didn't. Right. Um, and they, they know me, and I'll regret it if I don't. So um, I said, okay, I'm not going to get my hopes up gonna get my hopes up but i'm sending in like a resume and a cover letter and saying hey i've worked for you before would you consider me for the position and they wrote back and said when can you come in for an interview and that was it was pretty much gold from there because they did already know my work right and yeah they said yeah this guy can do what we need we can train him in the rest um but he's done a bunch of good writing for us and we think he's a good candidate and i'm like Okay, I'm moving back to Wisconsin. Yeah. So yeah, you were a known quantity. And so how long did you work on the magazine? I worked on the magazine in both Dungeon and then later Dragon Magazine uh, for about five years. No, oh, wow. four and a half, something like okay. that. But now, it was right in that final era where TSR was struggling. Yeah, that must have been kind of wild. Um, I, I actually had heard a rumor that you were the first person to see a Chris Perkins submission yes. and publish it's that. Is this true? It's true. He wrote such a good cover letter. Uh, and then he wrote a great query. And I'm like, this guy's really good. Who is he? And it was my job at the time to pull stuff out of the slush pile. Right. right. <laughs> and I'm like, he's super talented. And I showed it to my boss, who was Barbara Young at the time. She was editor of Dungeon. And she's like, oh, yeah, this is good. Have him send in the rest. And when he sent in the manuscript, I was just, I was floored because his map was so good, right? Yes. Even before I looked at the text, he did little hatching mm -hmm. on it. It was all in ink. And I'm like, man, I barely dare do a map in pencil. This guy's drawing maps in ink. And it was neat and crisp. And it was like an interesting shape. And then I read the manuscript and I'm like, well, he's Canadian, so he doesn't know how to spell. But other than that... <laughs> Right? It was, it was I, brilliant. Yeah, I lived in Canada for five years. I know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm never going to be fully convinced that he's not an android of some kind because uh, that's it's just ridiculous how good he is at like, kind of all the steps. I think we took pretty much every manuscript he sent us for, for the time I was there. Oh, wow. And I think his path in some ways was similar to mine, right? Like prove yourself by submitting stuff to the magazines. And then people say, well, hey, this guy's good. Let's hire him, right? It's much right. easier to bring in that known quantity. And yeah, the talent was pretty much obvious from day one with Perkins. Right on. So you, you mentioned that this was kind of the end days of TSR. And yeah. it was kind of, uh, you know, th there's a lot of biographies about the, the, the end of days for that company as transition to Wizards and things. But so at a certain point, you transitioned and you started doing your own magazine, started mm -hmm. what is now known as Cobalt Press. Yep. Tell me about the origins of Cobalt Press. So actually, it's still the magazine business, yeah. Um, Dragon Magazine had ceased publication back in, uh, it was 14 years ago now. Yeah, 2006, I want to say 2005, 2006. And I was like, well, gosh darn it, I know how to publish a magazine, and there should be a print magazine. And Dragon said, well, we're going online. I'm like, yeah, that's the future, but there still should be a magazine. I was I was very, I don't know, I wasn't looking to the future. I was looking to <laughs> what I knew. <laughs> yeah, I want to send a stamp in the mail. and I Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's like, well, I want to do this. So I did a magazine called Cobalt Quarterly, which launched in like 2006, 2007, and closed up shop by 2010, I want to say. Like okay. there was a four-year run of it, um, four issues a year. And by the end, we were pretty professional. But at the start, like issue yeah. one is... Like I laid it out myself and learned that I don't know how to do layout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but I got a beautiful piece of cover art by Darren Calvert, which later became sort of the iconic Cobalt and the mascot of the company. So, um, and I had this Rolodex full of like people I knew who could write magazine articles and illustrators and like, I had all the contacts you would need to run a magazine. So yeah. I literally said, Hey, Mr. Ed Greenwood, would you write me a little piece? And he's like, well, sure, of course. And like three days later I had it right. <laughs> like, And people were very generous and very kind. And, um, and it made possible to launch a magazine at a pretty high level of quality when I didn't know how to do anything except edit, right? right. Like, not an art director, not a layout person, um, didn't know how to do sales and distribution. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot that goes into it. Right. But the fans showed up and they all said, sure, I'll subscribe. You know, where do I send the money? I'd love a print magazine. Um, and it hung on as long as it could. But by the end, it was kind of clear, like, yeah, okay, Wizards of the Coast was right. The, the place for print magazines is is gone. And even as sort of a fan piece, it's so much work and it doesn't pencil out. And it, it I had to let it go, which then enabled me to do hardcovers and bigger projects and freed up my time to do the Cobalt Press we know today. Yeah, and so you guys have kind of shifted. It's still, like you said, in a way, a magazine, but now it's the hardcover books that yeah. are coming out at a phenomenal rate, I think, yeah. and is like everything you wanted for a year's worth of a magazine of like monsters or spells, all in one great hardcover. So as it sits right now, what is like the vision or the purpose of Cobalt Press? Is it world domination or do you just <laughs> want Australia or <laughs> – I'd settle for North America. That'd be all yeah, right. <laughs> pretty great. <laughs> it is. Um, wow. Our our big vision right now is just to be sort of the leading third party provider for D and D, right? Like to be the people who do the weird, wacky stuff that, for one reason or another, um, Wizards of the Coast can't do or won't do because they have a different vision, right? Right. So, um, so we do big monster books. We do big books of magic. We have our own campaign setting that we publish in like a 300 page volume. Um, we publish online maps. And honestly, we still kind of have a magazine. It's called Warlock. It's a black and white, like, you know, tiny That's little zine. Like Ashcan kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's an Ashcan sized thing. Uh, there's no color, there's no advertising. It's sold through Patreon only. It's like, I do it because I love it, not because it makes sense. Um, it's <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but it's small, so it doesn't eat my life the way Cobalt mm -hmm. Quarterly did. Um, but yeah, and the other part of the Cobalt vision right now is is really to be that first rung for new voices. Yeah, uh, it used to be that working in the magazine department, I would see people in the slush pile early, and I would be a way for people to be discovered. Well, you know, having a small third party group that is publishing a fair volume of content and working with new writers and new artists um, means that some of our people get snapped up elsewhere. <laughs> and that's OK. Like people ask me occasionally, like, you know, some of your people have gone on to jobs at Wizards of the Coast or Paizo or Green Ronin or wherever. And I'm like, yeah, but they're not really my people, right? They're freelancers who have earned their slot and they've spent some time in the word mines with Cobalt Press. Yeah, extracting and, those vowels from those deep veins, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, they've they've done the work and they've learned something working for Cobalt, right? And they've like, here's how you write an art order or, no, when we say 3,000 words, we really mean 3,000 words or or whatever it is, like working with the editor um, or seeing how long it takes to go from here's my manuscript to here's the book. Um, and so, yeah, like Dan Dillon is the most recent example. He's a yeah. staff designer at Wizards of the Coast. And he still does a little for us now, but really he's got a full-time gig there, right? Yeah. And he totally earned it, but we're happy to have been a place that he did several years. Good, good fifth edition design with Cobalt Press first. So yeah. that's, that's part of it. Yeah, I like the way that you kind of look at it, that it's not like they're not my people, but you it must feel a little bit vindicating. You're like, see how well they're doing. Yeah. I was right. 
I saw them. <laughs> I yes. gave them a chance. And you know what? All of y'all want them now because I was right. Uh. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can tell sometimes a manuscript comes in, a query comes in, and it's full of fire. And, and you say, this person really wants it. They've got incredible ideas. Um, they've got a way with words. The copy's clean. Um, and you say, well, of course, I want to publish this. Other people are going to flip. Yeah. Um, the art director is going to be thrilled. The editor is going to say, well, it still needs improvement. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the editor's job, right? <laughs> right. But it's so much easier to polish something that comes in as silver as opposed to something that comes in as tin, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, working with, with some of these people is fantastic. Other people, like, they just want to publish once and then they're done. Yeah. Right? Like, they just want to prove they can do it. Absolutely. Uh, and that's fine too. We've got uh, we've got projects where people just show up, are brilliant for a very brief time, and and disappear. Yeah, they had that one great story they wanted to tell. Yeah, they told it, and they're like, "I'm good." Right. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, and fine. that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely fine because they've they've created some great things that they get to share with this community. So yeah. So now you guys are like you said before, doing the hardcover books, and you've got one that's coming out really soon. It's on Kickstarter right now. Yeah. Uh, called the Tome of Beasts 2. Tell me a little bit about the Tome of Beasts and what uh -huh. people can expect from that. Sure. Uh, well, obviously, this is a sequel, and it's a monster manual. Uh, the original one we kickstarted five years ago, and it was a big hit, and we've kept it in print for five years, so that tells oh, wow. you it's done well. It, it yeah. It's on to its third, no, fourth printing now, which, you know, they're much smaller print runs, but still. <laughs> That's still, there's demand for it, yeah. There's demand for it. Um and the Tome of Beast 2 is everything we've learned in the last few years, um, and it's 400 new monsters that you don't know, right? And your players don't know, um, with the best art we can muster. And so far, we've got, oh, I don't know, 4,000 backers? <laughs> yeah. I was looking at it this morning, you have like over 4,000 backers, and it's it hit over uh, $270,000. Like, this book is going to happen. Uh, it, it's yeah. well oh, over its, its fun goal. We're, we're going to use, you know, all the best artists. We're going to take our time to get it right. We're going to create a set of um, encounters that goes with it. So you get the book right away, and then you have like, I don't know how many, it depends on stretch goals, but maybe 12 or 15 ready-to-play encounters using the monsters from the book. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to do cardboard stand-ups. Yeah, so, I saw those. Those are really Yeah, cool. they're really thick ones. Like, they're not like paper folded over ones. They're actually like chips as heavy as you'd get in a quality board game. That yeah. kind of thing. And you can just slot them in a little plastic base and you're, you're good. Because one of the hard things about a new monster manual is, where do the figures come from, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think your favorite monster or the monster that uh, really springs to your mind the most when you think about uh, what's already going to be included in the Tome of Beast 2? Oh boy, that's always hard. It's like, which, are, it? your, yeah, which are your children do you love best? Well, um, I love them all. They're all great monsters. I think right now I'm most excited about a monster that is really... It's my creation. Uh, I'm always more excited about my monster than anybody's. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not always true, technically. Uh, but in this case, it is. Um, it's sort of a demon lord called the Lord of the Satar. Um, and the Satar are the world-ending, worm-like, hideous... Uh, it's like dragonborn crossed with uh, alp bino maggots i don't know they're hideous things that gnaw at the universe and try to bring the end times so it's an apocal a lord of the apocalyptic race um i don't know why i'm so into the apocalypse at the moment but okay sure why not uh, and so this is like a, a cr18 or cr19 yeah uh, big boss monster um who's kind of responsible for gnawing at the roots of the world tree and bringing around Ragnarok and he's doom ridden and I want to create this monster in a way that there's reasons not to fight him just to talk to him um, yeah. so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to make that happen we did uh, in Tomo Beast 1 we did Lords and Ladies of the Fae yeah. uh, in a similar way where they could be foes and they're certainly not always friendly but there were also good reasons to occasionally just show up and beg them for a favor 
or show up and say, Hey, I, I want to, I want information. Um, and I think doing that with sort of a, a decayed and apocalyptic demon Lord ish figure is going to be interesting. Um, but yeah, the design is sometimes more about the mechanical side, sometimes yeah. more the lore side. This guy's clearly a lore guy for me. Um, yeah, it's great having different roles with your monsters. Some are supposed to be big bads, you know, BBEGs. Mm-hmm. Others are there to help move the story along in a kind of a lore or a role-playing kind of way, like the the kind of uh, dragonborn maggot things you mentioned are like they're mm-hmm. agents of, of entropy they want to see the end of all things yes. um but uh sometimes it pays to have friends in high and low places for yes. you to keep the story moving so absolutely yeah so um you know you talked about tome of beast 2 you talk about what people can expect um if people go to the website uh on updates there's all of these monsters about 13 or a dozen or so that you've already kind of highlighted from the new book yep. uh that people can see the art they can see kind of some of the description it's really really a phenomenal uh phenomenal project that i, I can't wait to get actually i've already made my pledge and oh, so thank you. i'll be getting it for sure um, but, uh, why don't you kind of give everybody like where they can find Cobalt Press, where they can find the Kickstarter sure. and kind of the final pitch, Hey, go get Tome of Beast too. <laughs> all right. Well, Cobalt Press is all over the web, right? Uh, we're on Twitter at Cobalt Press. We've got a blog with a lot of free content and a store, uh, at CobaltPress.com. Um, we post three times a week and often it's freebies. Um, we're on Facebook, both um, as Cobalt Press, and there's a fan site called uh, Midgard and Cobalt Press, Cobalt Press and Midgard, one of those two. I'll uh, find the is, link and put it down there. Yeah. yeah, that one's great because a lot of the designers show up and answer questions there, and the artists and cartographers too. Um, and I'm forgetting one. Oh, the Warlock Patreon is uh, patreon.com slash Cobalt Press. Um, so we do a bunch there. Yeah, there's a lot of people working on Cobalt, and we, we generate new stuff all the time yeah. uh, and like to share it. At, on Kickstarter, of course, uh, you just got to search Tome of Beasts or Tome of Beasts 2, and it will come up and search for you. Um, the final pitch, I think, is really we've learned a lot since five years ago. We play yeah. test like mad. We've done three, uh, yeah, three books. Cobalt Press is done for Wizards of the Coast, so we sort of know the official ways and means of doing stuff. We did uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat, and Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Um, so we sort of have a little bit of an inside track on the way Wizards does it, but we do things our own way and our own playtester groups. Um, and I guess the final little bit I'd mention is... Um, if you want, if you feel like taking that first step into game design, uh, Tomo Beast 2 has this thing where we take backer submissions. You can write one monster uh, if you pledge at, I don't know, $25 or something or more, yeah. and send it in, right? And if the judges like it, we will get it fully playtested, edited, illustrated. Um, people who did this in Toma Beast 1, several of the writers were like, I love the art I got for my monster. Um, and and it's not a guarantee by any means we're going to get hundreds or a thousand submissions, right? Who knows? But um, we've only got room for like 50. Yeah. But it's a great way to see what the fans are thinking about and see wildly different perspectives. And we get to, I mean, from our perspective, we get to... Uh, pay new designers their first check and and bring them in and get something that's the cream of the crop of, of fans and DMs who maybe have been using this monster for years and maybe thought of it the weekend before the deadline, right? But right. it's a way to open the gates, um, which is part of what Cobalt does. So, yeah, uh, pledge for the Tome of Beast 2. You will have a huge monster collection, beautiful art, um, heavily vetted, and wildly original stuff um, in, a, in a matter of months. So, Right on. Yeah. So, uh, Wolfgang, thanks for taking time with me. I really appreciate it. If, if uh, anyone out there wants to uh, grab this book, it's just so many monsters in there. I've seen a couple of little sneak peek things, which are really awesome. 
And uh, if you want to turn your nightmares from when you were a child into reality, you can also <laughs> submit your own monster when you pledge $25 or more. Uh, but go to their Kickstarter, go to their Instagram and their Twitter, Cobalt Press. Uh, thanks so much, Wolfgang, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks for having me. It's been great. No problem.